my name is Chad Briggs. I'm a professor of public policy here at RIT AUK. And we're happy to be working with the Kosovo Chamber of Commerce, uh, American Chamber of Commerce, uh, <laughs> on, on welcoming uh, Mr. Brandt, the CEO and president of Contour Global. Uh, we'd like to have an open discussion here uh, about the policies, the programs, the future of Kosovo and Contra Global. Uh, now, I would ask, just as a formality, that uh, we adhere to what I would, what we call the Chatham House Rule, which is that in order to have an open discussion, that we not attribute any specific comments back to anyone in particular. We want to be able to say things. Uh, and w without fear that, that this will come back out immediately in the government and uh, the, the press or wherever else. Um, of course, we understand that Kosovo is a small country and it's hard to contain information, but, but please. Uh, just as a, a very quick background uh, about Mr. Brandt, um, he has been the, the present C CEO of Contra Global since uh, he helped found it in 2005. Uh, before then, he worked for the AES Corporation and working in South America, Africa, and Eastern Europe. Uh, he previously had his bachelor's degree from George Mason University in Virginia, a uh, master's degree at the University of Virginia, and law degree from Georgetown University. And also, we're almost family in the sense of we're both past Fulbright scholars. I saw this. I saw this. Uh, him to, uh, to Helsinki. So my cousins. <laughs> yes, yes, and distantly know each other. Uh, so what we're going to do today is have a discussion in terms of, well, we'll have a chance to have Mr. Zeka uh, make some comments about um, the, the nature of the Kosovo um, Ari or Kosovo C program. And then we'll, we'll ask a few questions, of Mr. Brandt, and then open it up to discussion with all of the audience. Uh, but I'd like to welcome Mr. Zeka and ask him to come up and perhaps, or, or you can speak from there if you wish. Um, <laughs> well, thank you, Chad, Mr. Brandt, representatives of businesses, government, students. It's really my honor to be here and to be to co-moderate this uh, uh, talk together with uh, Chad from RIT. I'm going to say a few things about the power plant, and uh, the power plant has so far gone through some, uh, I mean, it, it has been one of the most uh, discussed projects in the country. The idea about having a next power plant or a third one after Kosovo A and Kosovo B dates three de de decades ago, when uh, initially at the end of the 80s someone raised the idea of having a big power plant of 2,150 megawatts that will help turn Kosovo at that time part of Yugosla former Yugoslavia uh, into a uh, superpower or a big generator of electricity. This has continued uh, decades ago after the war when uh, again uh, there were discussions about having a similar size power plants but later on uh, this has been reduced to ideas of constructing a power plant to 1000 megawatts and uh, later on as the project has developed through different stages uh, the it has stopped or there the, the final ideas were having a power plant between that will generate between 500 and 600 uh, megawatts apart from uh, Going through these changes, the project has changed its name as well. Uh, Mr. Chad already mentioned that uh, initially it was called Kosovo C, and now it's called Kosovo RE, new Kosovo uh, power plant. But apart from uh, its name and its size and its capacity, uh, what is uh, to be said here, and which is a stance of the American Chamber of Commerce in Kosovo as well, which has constantly supported this, uh, the idea for construction of new power plant, is the necessity of uh, providing uh, uh, secured electricity supply and especially for the manufacturing uh, sector in Kosovo which has constantly grown. The project has gone through several stages uh, which I'm going to mention very briefly so that I don't overlap with what Mr. Brand is planning to uh, discuss here in front of you and later on we will have the opportunity to ask questions just like you will have the opportunity as well. In 2006 there was the invitation for expression of interest EOI. Later on in 2014 uh, the request for proposals came out. 2015, uh, the preferred operator uh, or bidder was uh, uh, selected. In 2007, there was the stage of the commercial conclusion. 
If I'm translating it right from Albanian, in 2018, the procurement of the contractor, the process which is going uh, on uh, right now, and I'm going to conclude here with uh, uh, naming the stages in, this, in which the project has gone so far. So let me pass the floor to Mr. Brand and hear more from uh, him. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you for the invitation. Thanks for, for having me uh, here to talk. Well, I'll talk about anything you want, really. I, I will, uh, I'll, whoa, I'll keep my remarks very brief. Um, uh, I've, well, let me tell you a little bit about Contour because y you may want to talk about the company and you may want to talk about uh, raising capital for a company or raising capital for uh, projects or you may want to talk about where we are <laughs> in the world. So I'll talk about Contour first and then after that um, we can talk about this project and then I'll, I'll tell you why I think this is an extremely easy project to support. Um, the curiosity of this project for me has always been that there's any opposition to the project at all. Uh, and so I look forward to hearing challenges to those who think the project uh, is somehow not n necessary. But briefly on Contour. So I started Contour um, in 2005 with three people, myself and, and we had two people in uh, the office in New York, literally one small office, and we had one person down in Brazil. And I started the company because I saw a need to develop power generation projects in different parts of the world. And I thought that a number of places in the world that had been spending decades trying to implement good policy and create an environment for investment had been successful, but then the multinational capital that was expected to come in wasn't coming in because in the power sector in particular and in the industrial sector in general, big corporations who should have been investing in parts of the world that were growing electricity were kind of pulling back and going home and going to their core, so-called core markets. And so I saw all these countries in the beginning in Latin America, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and in Eastern Europe that I thought had done a pretty good job of policy reform and had the ability to attract capital for new investment not being able to attract any capital. And I thought, okay, that's an interesting opportunity. So I left the company I was with, which was in the global power sector. I ran their, effectively ran their international operations. I had spent most of my career um, in the power sector looking at privatizing markets and markets that were being restructured in three parts of the world. So the areas of the world that I knew the most were kind of Eastern Europe into the former Soviet Union, Sub-Saharan Africa, and South America. So that's kind of where I thought there was an interesting opportunity. And the more I looked at that opportunity, the more I thought we could probably raise some equity capital and then get some investors to back a new company and then try to do some investing around the world in this space and then mobilize multilateral capital. So World Bank type capital, development bank capital, um, and then eventually regular f commercial bank financing. So that's what we did. We started, we were pretty successful in the early years in those markets. We actually brought power uh, investment into places that had not seen any previous power investment or had not really seen any previous private uh, sector investment at all. So we built, I'll give you an example, in Togo, which is in West Africa. It was our first large project. The country of f about 5.5 million people had an electrification rate of about 12% and had about 50 megawatts installed for the whole country. And we developed a new 100 megawatt plant uh, to burn gas coming out of Nigeria on what's called the West African Gas Pipeline and then also burn as a backup fuel, heavy fuel oil, in case the gas was unavailable. And the interesting thing about that project, which taught me a lot about how to approach difficult projects, is that everybody who saw the project said two things. It's necessary and it will not happen. It's impossible, it'll fail. <laughs> so 
The reasons that it would fail are always the reasons people give. It's too big for the country, the country doesn't need the power, um, th there's this kind of frozen in time perspective that a lot of people bring to power markets, which is the amount of electricity you consume today is the amount of electricity that you will consume forever. <laughs> and in the case of Africa, that leads to some interesting paradoxes because in an unelectrified country where you have 12, 13% of the population have access to electricity, if you keep this paradigm, you would never do anything. So the better way to look at it, I always, I always look at the world of power development from two perspectives. The first is, how, what is your unmet need for electricity and what's the cost? So rather than focus upon the 12% that have electricity, I focus on the, 82, the 88% who have none, and I kind of try to figure out what is the cost of not having electricity for that percentage of the population. So that's one prism you can use to, to think uh, analytically about developing power plants. And then the second I always look at is where does the country fall on the global per kilowatt hour per capita consumption of electricity. Like is it high or is it low? Because if it's high, you may not need to develop a project. If it's low, you have to ask yourself, is it low because people don't want to consume more electricity per capita? Or is it low because they can't? And if the answer is, which is usually the case, it's low, it's low because they can't consume more electricity per capita because either they don't have the installed capacity or because the installed capacity is so minimal, they can't attract industrial investment, then you can start to think, okay, what happens if I can get this country to move halfway to the average, or all the way to the average, or all the way to the peak? So when you start to, when you start to think about the world in, in, in our, my space, power development, in that way, you start to see some pretty interesting things. So the global, average for OCD countries, so OECD average of consumption of electricity per kilo, of measured in kilowatt hours per person is about 8,000, 8, between 8,000 8, 8,500. The U.S. consumes the most electricity per person at about 12,750 and the least is our various countries in Africa where they don't even measure. To give you a sense, in Togo, Togo consumes now, after our project was, was installed, about 157 kilowatt hours per person. So that's, the, that's kind of the way the world looks from the perspective of electricity consumption. So then you go into a market, and let's pick Kosovo, and you look at the consumption per kilowatt hour, of kilowatt hour per person, and you compare it to the OECD average, and you compare it to the European average, you compare it to the regional average, and what do you see? It's a big gap. So Kosovo consumes far less electricity per person than any of the regional countries or, in, or Europe as a whole. So you consume about, anyone want to guess? The OECD average is 8,000. The US is the, the most electricity intensive country at 12,700. Do you know where Kosovo is? You want to guess? How much? 4,000? 4, That's a good guess. It's half of that. It's 2,000. So 2,000 kilowatt hours per person is the, the average consumption in Kosovo. And if you think about other parts of the world, Brazil is about 2,600. So we have a bunch of power plants in Brazil, uh, wind farms and hydroelectric facilities, uh, and we've been working on several thermal facilities there. Colombia in South America uh, consumes about 1,600, 1,600 kilowatt hours per person. A lot of that's a function of the political instability, the civil war that existed for the last 45 years up until about two years ago. When you start to look at the neighboring countries, even if you look at a place like Bosnia, Bosnia consumes 3,250 kilowatt hours per person. And so there's a big gap. And so then you have to ask yourself, if you're in my sector and you're interested in these types of things, why does Kosovo consume only 2,000 kilowatt hours per person? Is it because they don't want to consume more electricity or they can't? <laughs> and can't can be defined as you don't have a reliable base of installed capacity. It also can be defined as you don't have 
a predictable amount of electricity to attract investment that needs more electricity. Because in a world of effectively competition amongst investment capital for, for private and public investment capital, most investors will want to find a place where they can rely upon electricity demand, both at the current level to be stable and at increasing levels to be encouraged to invest. So this project, and we'll talk about it in a minute, is a pretty easy one because my forecast for Kosovo would be within a decade, you will consume something like 4,000 to 4,500 kilowatt hours per person. And that's, that's with just a moderate amount of growth. And if you're able to do that, you have to ask yourself, well, where's the electricity going to come from? And there aren't that many options. Uh, there's certainly not a natural cross-border option. So effectively, when you look at Kosovo as a consumer of electricity, you see something that looks like an island an island uh, consumption location. So it, it, it doesn't have a lot of interconnection around. And then the interconnection it does have tend to be in countries that also need to consume more electricity and will. And so there won't be a lot of surplus power if nothing else changes. To give you a sense of how efficient, effective, and, and modern, and modern is important, infrastructure can change the way other investors think about a country, uh, I'll go back to Togo again. Um, in Togo, as that project made its way through the development process and then was financed, and people said, oh, it's going to be very difficult to finance. Who's going to finance a project in Togo? And we brought the US Development Bank in to finance that project, uh, the same one that I expect to finance this project uh, in Kosovo. And when that thing started to go up, when it started to be constructed, about two-thirds of the way through the construction period, we, start, we started to get visits from companies, most of them European, some of them from Asia, that were trying to figure out where they wanted to make meaningful industrial investment in West Africa. And the, the one that, that, that opened my eyes the most was the owner and manager of the port in Lome was looking at investing either in Benin next door to expand the port there or to build another, effectively double the port capacity in Lome. It's a French company and they came to us and they asked for a tour of the plant. And we're located probably five kilometers from the port. And so they took a tour of the plant and they said, we heard about this plant, but we didn't really believe it was going to be built. And now it's clear it's going to be built. Can we get a direct connection from the power plant to the port? Because if we can, we're going to, expand, we're going to double the size of the port here. And if we can't, we're going to do it next door in Benin. So it's a good illustration about how basic infrastructure, particularly with power, provides the framework that a lot of investors in other adjacent spaces and, and other big energy using industrial capacities want to see before they'll, they'll allocate and make investment decisions. So anyway, over the years we have built power plants in places with low um, per capita kilowatt hour consumption. We've built them in places that have high consumption but are trying to diversify away from a certain type of fuel or a certain type of, of technology. And so we have developed and built power plants in uh, Europe, in Eastern Europe, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and in Latin America. And we've also acquired plants and we operate all of these. And we've raised a lot of capital, and from 2005 with you know, three people in the office and no assets and no revenues, we've grown now to a company over a billion uh, of revenues. We have about 2,000 people. We're in 19 countries with about 105 different power plants. Uh, the size of the company is about four billion uh, U.S. dollars worth of enterprise value, so debt and equity, and we listed the company last year publicly uh, on the London Stock Exchange, so we're a publicly traded company uh, on the LSE. So that's a bit of background about Contour and kind of what we do and my role and how I think about it. This project, which I think we'll probably launch into 
a pretty extended discussion and debate here. This one to me is an easy one. Um, it has the, it, it, we've done a, projects with, with significant development impact over, over time. So we, we, we like to do projects where we feel like we're going to make a big development impact. So we're going to catalyze benefits that are not simply producing electricity, even for countries that need them. And this project is probably the single project with the biggest development impact that we've ever done. Why? Because Kosovo A should have been retired, you know, decades ago. I mean, that, that project is harmful to the environment. It's harmful to health. It's harmful to the ability of the country to attract investment because it's an unreliable power plant. And any new power plant in Kosovo is going to displace Kosovo A, shut it down, and that will have a very significant environmental impact. It's very unusual to do a project where you will increase capacity, increase the operating hours, so produce more electricity, and yet decrease emissions. So for as much as people will criticize coal-fired generation, and in certain contexts, we share that. We're not hungry to build coal plants all over the world. This one is actually reducing all the, the emissions of all the, the things that you care about. It's reducing CO2. It's reducing particulate matter, the dust, and the, which is really horrible for public health. And it's reducing NOx and SOx emissions, even though it's bigger. And the obvious reason it's doing that is because it's much more efficient. And it uses technology that didn't exist at the time that Kosovo A uh, was built. And it's technology that is almost impossible to retrofit on an old power plant. And so for me, despite the debate and the mixed opinions about should the country build a lignite fired power plant, it's a, it's a no brainer. I think that in any normal political environment, global political environment, this project would have been supported heavily as it had been up until about four months ago by all the multilateral institutions because it's really the poster child for the paradox that if you want to facilitate new types of electricity development, you need to create a reliable baseload capacity. And so, you know, for those in my company and those outside the company who would like to see renewable development be the future of Kosovo, and we would share that hope, you won't get there without reliable baseload capacity. And the only choice you have for reliable baseload capacity is a new power plant burning lignite coal. Why? Because that's what you have. You have lignite coal. <laughs> and you don't have natural gas, and you don't have any other source of reliable baseload capacity. So your choices are either keep A, a and B running, which for a lot of reasons is not going to help because it's not going to help environmentally. It's not reliable capacity. It's a horribly inefficient capacity. And it won't create the climate where you can integrate well future variable resource technologies like wind or solar or even things like battery storage. And so this one to me has always been easy and I've always been surprised that there's much of a debate around this project because I think once it is up and operational, people will quickly see the very big changes in the electricity market that will be created uh, as a result of it retiring A and frankly retiring B pretty quickly. Uh, B is not an, uh, a coal plant that should continue to run much longer. The other thing that I find <clears throat> paradoxical about the debate over Kosovo lignite is that while everyone focuses on Kosovo and should it or shouldn't have a lignite plant, <clears throat> lignite plants are being built all over the region, <coughs> excuse me, including with European government support. You have a huge lignite plant under construction right now in Greece, funded by which country? Does anyone know? Yeah. Germany. Germany. You have a lignite plant, a coal-fired plant actually, that just finished construction in 2015, I think, in Slovenia. Funded by who? Liridon. EBRD, the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, who has come out strongly against 
helping to finance the power plant in Kosovo. You have a power plant uh, that just finished construction is now operational in Poland that's funded by the Polish government and the French government and that was sponsored by uh, General Electric was the uh, was the construction there and then as somebody rightly pointed out you have Chinese built power plants either just completed or underway or about to start in places like Bosnia, Macedonia, Montenegro and so the curiosity of all of this from an international public policy perspective is why are we picking on Kosovo and this project? Like where's, where are the principles when it comes to either no more lignite or no more self-sustaining energy when all of these other countries are going through their loan application processes and all the other things that you have to do to get a power plant permitted and financed in the world today. So. But that, I think that topic will be one that's interesting to talk about with you. And I'm happy to talk about anything you would like. Um, and maybe we just open it up for questions? Um, or do you want to? Well, I, I think we were, we were going to start with a couple of our own. And then okay, we'll, um, shoot. Well, let me, let me just start with the obvious one. You, you made some reference um, to the US Development Bank. So where do you think the financing will come from? So I think it'll be uh, two sources. It'll be OPIC, uh, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, which is the US government's development bank. And it will be the export credit agency supporting the winning construction company in the tender. So that will either be Japan or Korea or a mix of uh, European banks supporting a general electric bid. So those, that, but OPEC will be a big important piece, and then you'll have the ECA, the so-called so -called Export Credit Agency. They'll be the second piece. Okay. Mr. Brand, let me continue to where you concluded. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned that uh, you mentioned several already completed projects, or the ones which are under development, or uh, plans for newer projects to be initiated in the future. What do you think is really triggering all this reaction towards uh, having a new power plant in Kosovo? Oh, what is triggering this? I think um, uh, my view on this is it's a, it's a it's an easy political win for the the you know cosmopolitan elites. Mm -hmm who are behind a lot of the, these types of decisions because you're picking on a country that's small and poor and weak and that's the, that's the easiest way to make headlines. And so whether you're talking about you know, the cocktail circuit in Foggy Bottom or in Washington or in Berlin, this is the place that people can feel good around like-minded, environmentally committed friends and it doesn't impact them in any way. Because what has been proposed for Kosovo, this so-called least cost option consisting of renewable energy and battery storage would turn the country into an experiment. It would be like, it, it would be the guinea pig of the world. No country in the world has that type of installed capacity and no country in the world has an, a, a lack of diversification in their baseload electricity generating, generating capacity. And so the idea that somehow this is a viable concept is absurd. And I think that pol you know, the politics of the environment today in many countries around the world encourages bold and grandstanding statements around environmental output, uh, particularly carbon related output, that doesn't withstand scrutiny within the country, but it's easy to, to galvanize opinion around a country that half the people who are involved in have never been to, have, don't think about and don't care about. And so, you know, it, it diverts attention away from things like, in Germany, the renewable investment boom and the transition that's occurring there or would like to occur has been accompanied by some of the highest levels of lignite coal-fired generation 
per kilowatt hour that we've seen in the last 10 years. And, and so as you look around the world, there's no country that has been subjected to this test, this test of what is, what is an experimental alternative that's never been implemented before, and, and that test then being used to, to define the policy position vis-a-vis -vis the a real project that is required in the country to displace assets that would not be permitted to run in Europe or any other OECD country. Hey, if you want to follow up. Okay. Kosovo does not provide that good of an environment for foreign investments, but uh, you mentioned a few of the reasons why you've decided to still go on with your uh, projects. Why haven't you given up uh, yet, uh, Mr. Brand? Well, so we, we've been around this project a long time. I know that the, the people in Kosovo you know, have been hearing about this project forever. Um, but we've, we've been involved in what, uh, pr this project in, for what feels like forever. Um, first, I think the first four rounds, we were initially partnered just after I founded the company with NL and PPC, the Greek utility and the Italian utility. And we went through two rounds of bidding with them, pre-qualified, and the project didn't move forward and did a lot of work. Um, then the next round, it was just PPC and Contour Global. And we went through a round there, did a lot of work. Project didn't move forward. Over time, because of the crisis in the European utility sector, the big European competitors who I expected to compete for this project, the two German utilities, RWE and Aon, uh, NL, PPC, they all went through crises of their own. Some due to financial crisis, some due to crisis in the electricity space, which kind of left us as the last company that knew the project intimately still interested and I felt like over the years we'd learned enough not only about the technical viability of the project it, technically it's a very strong project but about the development impact and the necessity for something like this to continue uh, and to be implemented and so we've you know kind of decided back in 2014 that we would give it one last chance and really focus and spend the type of development money you need to spend to kind of develop a project to the point where it's viable and, and you know fortunately we've received the commitment necessary from the government from suppliers to move forward. Uh, you, you mentioned the base load and um, so, so you're talking about energy security from one perspective but since you seem to know my background in, in security, there are different definitions of energy security, right? And, and so there can also be affordability, there can also be sustainability. So what would you say to the person in, say, the uh, village in the mountains, in Krileve, who, you know, their concern isn't providing baseload for foreign investment, they just know they can't afford electricity now for heating. And they're being told that because of the contract with Contra Global that the rates might well go up in the future. Um, and, and without any sort of, you know, they haven't heard a strategy for renewables in the future. They just know the prices are going to yeah, go up. Yeah. So it's, it's a good question. I've been involved in power development in developing markets, many grossly underdeveloped. You know, I've been in this space for two decades. And there's always a solution for the energy poverty, right? That solution always comes from the state. You know, whether it's in Argentina, or it's in a place like Togo, or, you know, it's in a um, country like Mexico. As you, as you build and develop your energy capacity, you are adding into the system modern equipment, modern uh, technology. It will have a cost that, that's meaningful in terms of a per kilowatt hour basis for, for the population and you have to address those that can't afford it. And, and that's the role of the state. And so, you know, to, the, to people who want to consume electricity but can't afford it, in every other country in the world, advised by the World Bank, I would mention, the solution is to come up with a solution for energy poverty that subsidizes at some level the poor below a certain level of, of income. And I, I don't know why that wouldn't be the approach here, too. I'll give you a few reasons. I've got several other questions um, prepared in advance. Uh, 
but I believe it would be a right uh, uh, moment for us to open the now or never, to move to the now or never stage. So I would kindly ask someone from, from the audience to use this opportunity and to ask questions about the Kosovo Array uh, power plant project. This is a unique opportunity that you have in front of you, Mr. Brand. So please go on. Hi, uh, I'm Kunti Javoy. I have a factory, also I'm the chair of the uh, production committee under the American Chamber of Commerce. I would like to ask you how uh, this new will impact uh, Kosovo production in the volume, price and quality uh, for tomorrow. We'll be, we will be having cheaper price and uh, uh, about electricity. Well, what do you pay now for electricity? Uh, you have a difference, but I think around seven cents. Okay, so seven euro cents, seven euro, euro cents per, per kilowatt hour. So quality will go up dramatically, obviously. You'll, you'll have a significant increase in quality. My guess is the price for this project, when the tenders come back and the financing terms come back, will be somewhere between mid to high six cents. This is where I think the project will price. This is this is an educated guess. We won't know for another two months, but my guess is you'll you'll get six cent power. So, better price. Okay. Someone from the students, so that we balance some. Do we have any student before I decide to give the floor to the gentleman who asked for it? No. Please go on. Uh, okay, my name is Vesak Skanderi, and I'm coming from uh, College UBT. And I have a question, since we are having the past uh, large projects in Kosovo, but uh, the, the best, best practices and uh, knowledge had disappeared after the project was finished. Do your company plan to work with local companies or to build some uh, capacities or to share some knowledge with local universities or, or with other institutions in Kosovo? So our, our, our model is to um, manage and operate our businesses with employees in the local community. So that's the model. We, we do a couple of things to enable that. So with a project of this size, uh, when thinking about now the operational period five years from now, we will start recruiting early. We'll also will fund technical institutes and areas within the, the economy or even in, in neighboring countries that can supply the, the uh, know-how, the training for both managerial level personnel and then shop floor personnel, labor in, in the plant. We will uh, usually bring in, in the early years of operation, for a plant of this size, you'll have somewhere between two and five expats who've been with the company, been with Contour for years and knows how we, know how we operate. And then we will expect the local management to rise to the level of um, uh, executive management within the business so that the expats can be rotated out. And then the other thing we do is with the managerial level within the country, we're trying to recruit people who are mobile. So we want people who are multilingual, who want to live and work in other parts of the world, given our footprint globally. And it generally is seen very favorably by the countries where we invest, because we create opportunity not only within the country, but to work for a multinational in different parts of the world. Um, I think the. What should be happening now, and, and my guess is you, you could get some help here from some of the multilateral uh, development agencies as well as some of the donors, is creating the technical capabilities that you need inside the country to support the construction period. So uh, welding, right, welding is usually the thing that is in the most short supply for a major power project like this, and having built plants in parts of the world where there was almost no welding capacity. We've seen two things. First, how hard it is to find qualified welders. Secondly, how well paid those positions are. And so one of the things that, that we had in discussion with the government last year after we reached commercial close was a discussion around 
helping the construction community in the country develop welding capabilities. So either getting donors to start funding transfer programs where you can send literally send employees away for a period of time to learn to be certified welders or to create institutes where you can fund the development of that skill set. It takes between one and two years of training to have a certification in welding that you would need in order to be selected by the construction companies that will build this project, but I think it's a great investment to make, both, both for companies and for uh, the, the state, uh, because the jobs pay extremely well or in a very high demand, even in the region, are in very high demand. Um, the other thing is I think that the, the civil construction community, so the civil works community, the companies engaged in small to medium-sized construction should really start to talk to each other and think about ways to either form alliances or merge so that they can be key subcontractors for the, the uh, um, construction companies that bring this power plant into existence. The, the modern industrial construction model, as you probably know, is to subcontract more than 80% of the work. And that subcontracting should happen inside the country. But for that to happen, you, you have to have a size and a level, a, a facility with international commercial norms that these large construction companies will expect to see. And so sometimes what we see when we go into a country and start building a, a project that's much larger than the country's seen before is it takes you know, four or five of the main civil construction companies to, to merge, you know, so that you wind up with two, so they can really be competitive. One of the things that I've seen in talking to some of the EPC contractors, and they've started to look at the labor pool that we should all try to avoid, is a lot of them think, okay, we're only gonna be able to source the welding in Croatia, for example, because there was a recent very large coal-fired power plant built there. We're gonna have to look for civil construction firms, not just in Kosovo, but in the, regions, in the region generally. And I think this is a great opportunity given when the construction will start to really prepare to serve in very lucrative contracts with the EPC contractors. So. There's a student in the back. Hi, I'm a junior student for RIT Kosovo and I would like to thank you for participating today in this meeting. Um, knowing that Europe has been funding coal power for several states, let us understand that the real problem is not the coal itself. So what if the real reason of Europe of not supporting us is not the coal, but the procedure of reaching the, that contract where the US was the main uh, actor of that one and Kosovo government had no bargaining power at all? Okay, so you're saying that the contract is too expensive? That one of those, that is one of those reasons, and the second one is that Kosovo was not actually uh, the main actor of that same co contract. And maybe that's what Europe actually is not supporting that one. So w when you say Kosovo wasn't the main actor as the counterparty, what do you mean? What I'm meaning is that the agreement was mostly written by U.S. Actually, which uh, just as there are a lot of articles written that it's actually illegal with the Europe laws. Yeah, okay, so um, let's talk about how Kosovo was involved and advised during this entire process. And this is all public record, so if you want to find it, you can. Um, the U.S., meaning, I guess you mean the United States government, they certainly did not draft the contracts. So these contracts, if you look at a, a modern private power investment, it usually results in something like 1,000 pages of contracts. Usually there's a concession agreement of some type, a, a power purchase agreement, a fuel supply agreement, water agreement, various ancillary documents, transmission agreement, et cetera, et cetera. Very, very technical. And what Kosovo did, which is what most developing countries do, is they realized that given the level 
of technical knowledge required to properly negotiate these contracts. They sought outside funding to hire experts to provide advisory services in three key areas. In power, uh, commercial power issues, in um, technical power issues, and then legal. And so that funding was provided primarily by the World Bank. The IFC, the International Financial Corporation, by the way, this is the ultimate irony. The World Bank at the end said they're not sure they support the project, but they facilitated it getting done. Um, and I thank them for that because had they not supported the project so strongly, uh, we would not have signed all of the agreements that we did in December of 2017. But the World Bank funding then was used to um, provide a dedicated team from the IFC, which is the private sector arm of the World Bank, to advise the government of Kosovo. And they did. Uh, they did that and, and did that well. It also uh, provided the funding for uh, financial expertise needed to create a financial model of the entire project. Uh, and they did that, and they did that well. And they also used this funding to hire a law firm, a U.S. law firm, called Hunton and Williams, um, and bring in two senior partners who've worked on this project, I think, for the last eight and a half years, uh, and who represented the government in its negotiations. Anybody, uh, so the government was extraordinarily well represented and enabled its representation through donations, donor funding, um, primarily from the bank. And it's just simply false to suggest that those agreements, and it's, wor it's worth looking at them, are not standard form, sophisticated, negotiated agreements. In addition to that, the government always had the ultimate leverage here over a private developer like ourselves because they could say no. <laughs> so the government always had the ability to say no. And the, the project has moved forward to the stage where it's imminently going to begin. And whenever I say that, particularly to the government, uh, including today, they're very skeptical as they should be because they've heard this all before, but this time it's real. Um, the project is one that the more we've gotten to know it and the more we've become comfortable with the commitment from the country to support it has, has caused us to invest a lot more than we ever had to and the so-called project development cost recovery guarantee is a fraction now of the total amount that we've spent on this project. So I, I recognize the politics of large infrastructure frequently are interrelated with general politics and I also recognize that today they can be interrelated to environmental politics but the record examined and, and understood fairly does not support the allegation that the government was not well represented and that the contracts are not balanced. No. Well, hello there. I'm Hekuran Murati, an alumni of this university. Uh, well, you previously mentioned the cost to the gentleman, which you said six cents, but I think that is false, and you know that because you're comparing. Oh, uh, just, hold on. just oh, no, no. Oh, no. Well, let's, uh, let, let, let me finish the question let's, first. Let's, 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 let's because not, you're comparing end, end user price with generation price. price. And don't you know that. Don't state what I said. Don't state Okay, what did you said. say? You said six cents. I said, he asked I about the end user price. Hold on. Yep. I said very clearly that I expect this project to price at six cents. That's what I said. He asked about the end user price. He didn't say Which is going to be, price. well, then let's compare it to the generation price currently, which is three cents. That is correct, I assume, right? So let, let's move on to the question. Uh, you previously mentioned that you've listed in the London Stock Exchange, and yes. that's a good thing, but Not you know, also... Not necessarily. Well, if it weren't, you wouldn't. Uh, 
But you also publish the prospectus, which is required for those who don't know, a prospectus is required for any company that's, that gets listed in a stock exchange, they have to publish it. And there they explain, they have to disclaim all the information about the company and the risks. And as curious as I am, I went on and read it, and one of the paragraphs caught my eye, and I'm going to read it. It says, Certain countries where Contour Global does business are characterized by a lack of transparency, public sector corruption involving government officials and related risks, which increase risk for potential liability under anti-corruption legislation, including the US Foreign Cor Corrupt Practices Act and the UK Bribery Act and other international anti-bribery laws. Is this an omission that you engage in such activities? I mean, since you've included it as a risk in your prospectus? Reread, read it again. Well, I just read it. Read it again. No, I'm and not going to give you we'll, time to think about an answer. No, I read every, it. Everyone will then listen to exactly what this is. It's a disclosure to the market that certain countries where we do business are not transparent. It's not a disclosure but, to the market that we pay bribes. But why would that be a liability to you then, if you don't engage in such activities? Because, because you're, you're, you're disclosing it as your liability. No, we're disclosing it as a risk of the company for investors, because it is a risk. Exactly. And the safe thing to do is never invest in countries that have non-transparent practices. No. But well, the right thing to do is invest in them and do it the right way. That's the right thing to do. Then why would you be liable for su such a thing if you don't engage in such activities? It's a risk. It's a risk. It's called If you risk. do it. The prospectus, no. A risk is a risk. What you're talking about is a risk realized. This is why it's called a risk factor. But what this means is the risk being caught. No. It's oh, yes. Not. It means that there is more risk doing business in non-transparent countries than there is doing business where there are low levels of corruption. That's what it means. But if you don't pay any bribes, why would this be a risk and why would you have to disclose it? You have to disclose the risk to your prospective investors about your business and where you're invested. And what are the risks of being invested? Because there are many investors who will say, I don't want to invest in a company that does business in the non-OECD world. Many, many investors do not want to invest in companies that invest in emerging markets. Okay. And, that and that's why you have to disclose oh, it. Just, just one more. Let us give the opportunity to someone else, and then if there are no more questions, we'll um, wrap up. I, I promise we'll come back to you again. So, any other students? So, that just. No, we, well, we just. It. It, it's, it's worth to, to the students, I think. To, to, the, no, no, no. Th this other question. I'm just going to ask about the rate of return. No, well, sorry, but I mean, I waited for this opportunity. Uh, the rate of return that is guaranteed to your company is 18.5%. That's correct. Levered. Levered. Which is, well, on equity. Levered. No, no, no. It's, on equity. it's on equity. No, hold on. <laughs> Don't, let's, let's just. I'm Trust happy, me, I'm, I'm happy ready. to have the debate, but I want to have the, the, the debate with the actual facts and not your facts. Mm -hmm. Levered equity. Levered. So there's debt on the equity. It's not unlevered. Levered 18.5. But whatever, whatever is going to be the rate or the, the, the interest rate paid on debt is going to be just passed through, right? Well, that is correct. No, I mean, okay, so what? <laughs> the way to think about it is we will earn 18.5% on your whether capital. the investment is on levered equity. Levered. Whether the investment is a billion or 800 million or 600 million, it's always 18.5. So from the counterparty's perspective, the government's perspective, they always want a lower price for the project because that 18.5% won't cost as much. Well, Warren Buffett is just shy of 19%. I mean, just to compare it. Just shy of what? 19%. What I mean, this it? is just shy of Warren Buffett's rate of return, which is, you know, the best investor ever. So don't, don't you know, don't so say this, saying, is, this is not a good rate. rate. What, what uh, do you think the rate of return should be for investing in a unprecedented largest risk free ever in the history of Kosovo? What should be the rate of return? Risk free? Well, risk, the, risk free. What's the risk free rate in Kosovo? 5.2%. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the last auction on a 10 year bond is that. So Okay, I what's mean, the spread? What's the spread over 5.2 that we should get? Zero? Is it 13%? No. It's okay, 5.2 unlevered. It's probably close to 11 unlevered. Which is probably where we are right now. We're at 18.5 levered. Sir, so, Kevin, we have a student over there.
and that will come to a business. How, how will this power plant increase the GDP of Kosovo mm -hmm. specifically? I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the calculation will be. I said how. How will it increase? Will it increase? <laughs> Theoretically, how will it increase? It'll increase the GDP because you'll see influx of investment, which will lead to direct and indirect employment, which will lead to greater consumption, which will lead to you know, contracts for businesses here. I mean, that'll be the direct impact. What the amount of GDP increase will be as a result, I don't know. What will happen with the workers of the solar plant pay? I don't know. I, I don't know. Hopefully not. I mean, you would think that if you have workers who are familiar with the operation of a lignite-fired power plant, that that skill set is interchangeable with a new lignite-fired power plant. But generally, you look at a market like this and you find that there's a shortage of skilled labor, not an overabundance. Okay. Uh, I'm Glenn Tusseni, a former student at AUK. Uh, I just want to thank you, Mr. Brent, for coming and give us, giving us the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, first, I have some concern about the project, uh, beginning with uh, beginning with the procurement process. I think it changed. Uh, we didn't know before that that uh, the company is going to engage in a, a long-term power purchase agreement, and then uh, and I'm I'm also glad that you have some legal background and maybe you can explain to us uh, some of the questions we have, and then after the contract was signed uh, and some of our colleagues got to read it, we saw that almost. Uh, every part of the agreement is in breach with state aid laws. With uh, state aid laws in Co Kosovo, uh, we also signed a, a stabilization and association agreement with the uh, EU and also clearly states that uh, this, would, this project would be in breach with state aid law. Uh, we had uh, you, the, the government of, of Kosovo received a, a, a letter from the uh, Energy Community Treaty where they specified exactly where the breach exists and they also uh, approved that this is a breach of state aid law. Um, so I just want to ask you how uh, how you're going to deal with, with uh, well so, that, okay, so meaning state that also uh, Contra Global was uh, part of, the, uh, of a breach in state aid law in Bulgaria. So is this going to be the same thing where we're uh, so, let, okay, well, let's talk about state aid, which is an interesting and, and um, multi-layered topic. So the, my first question every time people want to talk about state aid in Kosovo is, why do you care about state aid doctrine? This EU doctrine, wh why do people care about the EU doctrine? Because first, we have made a commitment to the Energy Community Treaty that we're going to uh, uh, respect the rules, and this is directly in breach with them. And also, it harms us the perspective to integrate in in uh, the EU. Yeah, it's fine. See, this is this is this is state aid theology. So the the history of state aid doctrine is that every EU country, first of all, there are two types of state aid: permissible and impermissible. Right? right. We agree on that, right? Right. But so the debate is always about: is it permissible state aid or is it impermissible state aid? And this is a debate, and it's been a debate in many many contexts, including in Bulgaria where there has not been a finding that it's imp impermissible state aid. <laughs> There's not been a finding that it's impermissible state aid. However, if you look at the accession into the EU of all the East European countries after 1989, there's a derogation procedure where you can get an exemption for state aid that's even considered impermissible state aid under the EU. And every single country that joined the EU after 1989 used the derogation procedure and not every project is exempted, but most are. I don't know why Kosovo, when the time comes to join the EU, wouldn't also use the derogation procedure. Can you name a country that was exempted from this rule? Oh, sure. The derogation, don't take my word for it. Look at Poland, look at Hungary, look at the Czech What's Republic. What happened with Hungary? They, they all had projects that they presented for the derogation procedure. They have to please the power process. Yeah, not every project is is accepted under the derogation procedure. It's a negotiation between None the future member state and the EU. None of it was accepted. They had to breach all the long-term power process agreements. Uh, I actually think the Hungarian, there's two cases around power. One's Hungary and one's Poland. And they're both different. Um, and they have different outcomes. And I think if you talk to the commission, and it's worth talking to them in the, anti, in the competition uh, directorate about state aid, 
they will tell you they prefer the outcome in Poland. Neither country asked for a derogation for the power plants. So that was the issue. Yeah. Hungary, Hungary the, the, the commission found they were in violation of state aid rules and the state had to, to abrogate the power purchase agreements. What the, what the EU laws then require is the state has to fund the investor so that they can recover their so-called stranded costs. It's the so-called stranded cost doctrine. So there's a methodology even when you forget or don't present your state aid requests to include certain projects that, that are not subject to derogation. I don't know why Kosovo, whenever that time comes that they decide to apply for EU membership, would not designate this project as subject to the derogation yeah. procedure. But also, like a, a com competitor company can sue Contour Global with Kosovo government for state aid because it's, it's within the competition. Not today they can. You're but talking about the, fu you're, you, you, right, the future. You're positing a future action by the state and the EU about a power plant that, that you've already concluded has impermissible state aid. And I'm saying it's not that simple to, to classify a state aid grant as being impermissible. There are many state aid grants that are found to be, including by the commission, permissible state aid. State aid is not illegal per se. Right, I'm, I'm not qualifying it. It's the Energy Community Treaty who did it, but uh, I'm saying a, a competitor company here, uh, when the <laughs> project starts being enacted, can sue Contour Global and the Kosovo gov government, in which case both parties should recover the aid. And, and this could be a, a, cri a public policy crisis in the future. It, it's not only the perspective to join the EU or the Energy Community Treaty, you can also get lawsuit from within. But uh, I think using national courts. only after only after EU membership. No, gentlemen, I, I, I okay. don't want to Thank cut you. you off, but uh, we, we are running up against it's a, time. Look, it's an interesting topic. I think I, I I would I would urge skepticism around the energy community's letters. I, I would I think the energy community is taking is 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 taking a very strong position on something that is not settled as a way to influence the, the politics of the project. Yeah, oh, okay. So, Mr. Bizimian, and we'll keep this one short. We, we know we're running up against time. Okay. So, we could maybe see from the audience that there is an overall concern about the long-term implications of the Kosovo Sea project either because we think that we are in breach with some of the domestic laws and you confirm that when you say that uh, we could apply for the derogation and unless we do we, it is in breach with the law and we know that we are breaching the competition laws because we are uh, exposing Kosovo A to a completely unfair competition now and uh, there are many other concerns for example giving 18.5 percent rate of return to a project with zero uh, risk. I don't think that you have we such have payment a... Risk. There is we zero risk because everything is guaranteed by the government. Okay, Actually, the guarantee, government... The guarantee you are forcing the, okay, You are forcing the government to buy also the energy that they don't use, which means the taxpayers will have to use. Uh, but my, think, my question is another one. Kosovo is going to consume more than... Well, okay. Kilowatt hours per I still don't future. put my point. So. so I'm talking here from two different heads, as professor of macroeconomics, resource economics, and public finance, but also as a politician. So. Uh, Assume that the project doesn't continue because it doesn't get ratified in the parliament. I'm pretty sure that this will happen. So what is then your plan B? Because I pretty much have the information that the process will not go through in the parliament. Well, we'll both find out, won't we? So we don't have to speculate. We have our we way, but we have our way, but and the I question is, do you have a plan B? That's you don't have to speculate, and I don't have to speculate. <laughs> I hate to be because we'll both we're both going to find out. I hate and I hate hope the I hope the parliament approves the project. I hate to be a party breaker, but I think this was all the time that was available to us to have Mr. Brenda and uh, responding to your questions and our questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Brenda. It was really a pleasure to be co-moderating this uh, panel. Thank you, Chef. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Have a good day.